which become of sound doctrine and gospel and do no damage to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Wherefore, King James says, or simply put, why did you doubt me? Wherefore didst thou doubt? Why did you doubt me? That is, please give me an explanation or a justification, Peter, for doubting me. That you doubted me is established. But would you please explain to me or justify your doubting me? Or what is the sound thought or judgment that you use that caused you to doubt me? I know you didn't just doubt me. And Jesus wasn't going to insult Peter and call him stupid or ignorant or dumb. So he wanted to know what is the sound thought. Or judgment that calls you to doubt me. What did you see that made doubting me logical? It's a very loaded question. And a poignant one. What is it that you saw? that caused you to doubt me? What is your rationale? I'm sure you have one for doubting me. I hold today that as I take my time and are intentionally redundant and moving at a snail's pace through this particular portion of my offering to you today that more of us are guilty of Peter's error than are not. You have to understand the question that Jesus asks Peter. You don't want anybody or anything to distract you while I try and explain the question. And we'll see whether or not we have and possibly are doing the same thing. The question our Lord asked him was, why did you doubt me? Doubt. To doubt is to become uncertain. What made you uncertain that I would take care of you on this water? Was it the first step, the second step, or the third step you took as you walked on the water? When you first stepped out, you believed me. You were certain that I could perform this miracle. What caused you to become uncertain? You initially decided that I was able to do this. To doubt literally means to become undecided. What? Calls you to become undecided in your beliefs 
than your belief in my ability. Doubt is uh, the inclination. It is to incline to unbelief. What led you to lean toward disbelieving me rather than to lean toward believing me? Why did you doubt? Doubt comes from a Greek word that literally means to waver. See, to doubt is not to disbelieve. To doubt is not unbelief. Doubt is, I'm just not sure. Looking for you. Is maybe, it's my cousin over there, or maybe not. Perhaps he can, perhaps he can't, perhaps he will. Or perhaps he won't. That's doubt. God might do it. God, probably, God may not do it. I'm going to make it. I'm not sure whether I'm going to or not. I'm going all the way. I'm going all the way. Doubt. 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 Doubt is not. I just don't think that God can do this. That's not doubt. That's unbelief. Jesus' question was not, why did you just simply stop believing me? That's way down the line. Jesus wanted to know, why did you even doubt me? As a pastor, as a pastor in a church who believes in miracles, as a minister of a church that believes in divine interventions, as a minister of a church that talks often about healing, deliverance, and declares that the God of the Bible is a way maker. I have to testify that when you study the meaning of words, we see doubt much more than we see belief. Very few folk, praise the Lord, there are very few who do not vacillate. One day they're going to live no matter what. I'm going to make it. I'm going all the way with Jesus. Next day the phone rang. You need, you, we need to have another conversation because we're not quite sure. One day I can do this, and I'm going to do this. Praise the Lord with the Lord's help. Next day, I don't know. I don't know whether I can do this or not. On Monday, the Lord said do this. On Tuesday, Lord, did you say do this? The Lord is asking. The Lord is asking. Why did you die? Why do you doubt me? Can I get a witness? Our Lord's inquiry certainly implies that he didn't see the rationale. He didn't see the justification. He didn't see the logic of Peter's doubt. Peter's sudden indecisiveness. His beginning to wonder whether or not this is a good idea. I mean, you're in a bad place. You're off the ship in the water. And there's Jesus, there's the ship, and you're in the middle out there walking on the water. That's a bad time to decide this might not be such a good idea. Amen. You know, you, if if as never as never before at that point, you've got to you got to finish. Can I get a witness? 
Our Lord wanted an explanation for Peter's behavior. Notice, he didn't need an explanation for Peter's request. Peter says, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come. Jesus didn't change any word. Come. Some people say they had, they had problem with Peter's question. It's apparent that Jesus didn't. He said, Peter's question uh, showed a lack of faith, uh, not according to Jesus, because a lack of faith doesn't move Christ. Faithlessness doesn't move the Lord. Peter's request couldn't have been sinful because had it been sinful, Jesus wouldn't have granted it because the Lord never sinned. And he had no problem whatsoever with his question. But after Peter began to doubt, Jesus had a question for him. Why did you doubt me? From our Lord's point of view, faith in him is reasonable. It makes sense to believe in Christ from his point of view. Also to believe that he is or at the time was the Christ and that you could take his word, could take him at his word in Jesus' mind made sense. It makes no sense. It makes sense, excuse me, to believe Christ. It is reasonable to believe in him and to believe he is who he tells you he is. To trust what he tells you. You know, in the Lord's mind, the Lord is thinking, you know, Peter, yesterday you were there when I had a crowd of at least 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children. So it could have easily have been a 15, 5, 10, $15,000, 15,000 15, <laughs> in number crowd. Because a good number of the men were married and their children were there. Jesus says, you saw me take two fish and five barley loaves and pray and feed all of them. No Bojangles, no Hardys, no McDonald's, no uh, Ruth Chris, no J. Alexander. Just me. Two fish and five barley loaves. And I blessed it. You saw me. And uh, after seeing me perform this miracle, how, how is it that you came to the conclusion that you weren't quite sure whether I could sustain you or not? Even though I had sustained you up until to that point. I kept you with the first step. And, 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 and I kept you with the second step. What happened that made you doubt me along the way? I can't get any help here. <laughs> let, let, let's, let's look at what led to this divine intervention, this miracle in nature. To save a weary, worn, wet, cold, frightened, worn out fisherman. A man who had faith, but not enough faith. A man who could focus like a laser and then lose his focus like a blind man. Multiple things led up to this event. That could have had a tragic end, but it ended up uh, with the greatest victory. Now, the contextual setting, as I forementioned, um, 
was that our Lord had just had a big day. It was a big, big day. It was a day filled with both good things and bad things. It was a day where our Lord emotionally had to have been filled, at least where he's on his human side, with ambiguity. Um, as I forementioned, one of the things that had taken place was the miracle of multiplication. I really like John's account because John gives us a little more, uh, well, quite a bit more insight than Matthew does with the miracle of multiplication because when, when Jesus got ready to feed the people, the Bible says in John 6 and 5, and when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said to Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And look at, look at John's note that he added. He says, and this he said to prove him, to prove Philip, for he himself knew what he would do. Jesus paused the question. He paused this dilemma to test Philip's faith because he knew what he was going to do. Some of the things you're going on that's happening in your life today is just designed to test your faith. The Lord doesn't, doesn't have to go out and make a plan. Plan's already made. The way is already made. You just have to believe it. So he tests Philip. He says, Philip, where are we going to get enough uh, bread to feed this crowd? Philip answered him, 200 penny worth, eight months wages would not be sufficient. Wouldn't give us enough bread to feed this crowd even if every man just had a little. The crowd is too big. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, and this was, he really didn't, didn't he, you almost wonder why he even said it because he certainly didn't believe that this was the solution. He said to, 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 to Jesus, there's a lad here, verse 9, which has five barley loaves and two small fish. Notice, <laughs> he lets him know the fish are small. <laughs> so he had, no, he had no confidence in this. As a guy, as a kid here, he's got two, five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? He said it not offering it as a solution. He said it, uh, all, it was almost comical. He, he, he actually made the statement to actually lend to the uh, perceived absurdity of our Lord's request. We're out here with no food. This huge crowd is here. That could be 10,000 to 15,000 people. You want to know how are we going to feed them? If we had eight months wages, we couldn't feed them. Hey, oh, yeah, okay, well, here's a kid here with five barley loaves and two little fish. But, but what, is, what is that amongst so many? And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down. In number, that was 5,000. Matthew tells us 5,000, not counting the women and the children, according to Matthew 14 and 21. John tells us 5,000. All right? So it could have been easily, as, as I forementioned, 15 to 20,000 people there. And then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had, look at this, given thanks, he distributed, distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they would. And, uh, and, and after they were finished eating, he said, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. See, Jesus didn't, didn't throw away leftovers. He said, gather 
the fragments. See, he was being a good steward. That's a good lesson to you, sir. So much, you know, you're struggling, but you're throwing everything away. And you better put that food in the refrigerator. <laughs> Amen. And warm it up and eat it tomorrow. That was uh, one of the great things that happened that day that really blessed our Lord. Are you with me? But there was also something else that happened that shook him. According to Matthew's gospel, chapter 14, verse 10 through 12, tells us, um, and when he sent and beheaded John in prison. And his head was brought in on a charger and given to the damsel. And she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it. He took John's body and buried his headless body. And after John's headless body was buried, his disciples went and reported to Jesus. Verse 13, the A-clause says, and when Jesus heard of it, he departed thence into a ship to a desert place apart. When he heard how John was killed, he went into a ship to go to a desert place to mourn the death of his cousin, forerunner, servant, baptizer, and friend. The man in whom dwelled the spirit of Elijah. Jesus loved John. And John loved Jesus. While Jesus was trying to mourn the death of John, that's when the crowd came. So he had to feed the crowd. Do ministry with a broken heart. It was a tough day. Everyone who does this, a young preacher said to me on last evening, he said to me, you know, Pastor, I thought that uh, I knew what pastors go through. I thought I had an idea of what it is to lead a ministry. He said, but now that I'm out here doing this, I learned that I had no idea whatsoever to the difficulties of the task. And I looked at him and I said, and you know, all pastors also know that young ministers, when they're talking about it, if they hadn't pastored, have no idea. We know why we're listening to you, that you have no idea. Sometimes the weight and the responsibility, the burden of ministry is a very heavy one. Amen. There's a responsibility assigned to whatever it is that God has given you to do. And if you're in the service industry, people only want what they want. Somebody wrote a song and said, make us laugh, clown. I know you've had hard times, buddy, but laugh, clown. I done paid my dough. I want to see a show. Make us laugh, clown. Could care less about the clown's broken heart. Mm -mm. Make them laugh. The crowd was hungry. They needed to eat. Jesus had to feed them or they would have perished in their travels. What a day. So after feeding the crowd and hearing the news of John, verse 22 says, straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him 
on the other side. Notice the use of the word constrain. He had to make them leave him alone. He needed some time to himself. He said, I want y'all to go. They said, oh, we're not going to leave you. We, we know, we know that you, about John, we know. No, 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 no. Look, Peter, all y'all, get on the boat. Leave me alone. Go to the other side. I, I'll be there after a while. It's just a little short trip. A skip and a hop. And, and I'll be there soon. But you, you need to leave now. I need some time alone. And uh, after he sent them away, he said to the crowd, don't be the guest who refused to leave after dinner. <sighs> I've fed you. Go home. And even if you don't go home, leave here. <laughs> you got to go. 5,000 men, not counting the women and the children, really didn't want to go anywhere because here is a walking supermarket, a walking hospital, a walking uh, money machine. If you need to pay tax, he'll send you down by the river. And you can find uh, tax money in the fish mouth. Whatever you need, this man has it. Jesus said, go home. Go, go. So after he got rid of the disciples and, and when he had sent the multitude away to make sure he could find some privacy, then he went up into a mountain apart to pray. Whew. Alone at last. No cell phone. No text, no interruptions, no questions, nothing. Alone with the Father. Good God Almighty. He had to work to get by himself. And uh, I feel my help. While there, uh, look, look what the text says. The text says, and when evening was come, he was there alone. Isn't that wonderful? Evening here. For those who are paying close attention, it's between 7.30 and 8 p.m. It was late evening, between 7.30 and 8. Jesus is finally by himself talking to the Father. Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day. God First.